<sighs> I can't believe this review was so bloody difficult. I don't usually do a pro and cons list right up front, but this review was so complicated that I thought it merited one. I should point out, too, that when I make comparisons to other anamorphic lenses, I'm not talking about Ari or Vazen or really any lens that costs over $20,000. Those are in a class by themselves, made for million dollar movies. And really, you shouldn't be buying those lenses. They're designed for rental. And at that price point, they are nearly technically perfect. My comparisons are to sub $10,000 lenses, which is already 30 times more than this adapter. In this price range, you're typically balancing the pros and cons you see on this list. And to understand them all, you have to see the sample footage in the review. If you knew me, you'd be surprised by my foray into anamorphics. I mean, I don't particularly like oval bokeh. I've got nothing against them, I just don't think they're any more beautiful than round ones. And I'm not fond of horizontal flares. Nowadays, I think they're better done in post, where you can use them judiciously. And I find the argument that it's bad to crop your image for a widescreen perspective because you're throwing away pixels is, dare I say, dumb? I mean, yes, you are technically throwing pixels away, but if you don't need them, if there aren't useful visual elements, then what does it matter? What's more important is that the pixels that remain are the right pixel density and size. You're not cropping and zooming when you create a widescreen. If you're shooting in HD, you're getting the correct number of pixels per square inch when you crop. You can argue that maybe you had to back farther away from your subject in order to have the extra height in the frame, making the person or goose have fewer pixels. But consider what happens in anamorphic. You squeeze more visual information into the pixels and then stretch it out in post, a process that's identical to zooming in post. The pixels are no longer their original size, they're bigger horizontally, and that physically deteriorates the image. The part of the image you see, not the part that you don't. Technically, anamorphics are more damaging to the visual integrity of the image. So, why did I drop hundreds of dollars on this adapter? Well, I love the 28mm as a focal length, but I'm aware that it subtly distorts the face. It's partly due to the fact that you have to get closer, making the nose bigger and the ears smaller, but it's also because wider lenses tend to barrel and distort more. If I shoot with my 50, my other favorite length, the face is correctly proportioned, but there's not much environment on either side. The 50 tells only a narrow story. The anamorphic lens gives you the focal distortion of your chosen lens, but adds width, expanse to the scene. In essence, it promises the best of both worlds. Unfortunately, a set of top-level anamorphics will cost about the same as a house in North Dakota. In truth, some of the very best anamorphics you can't buy at all, you can only rent them. But the anamorphic world is changing, and boy is it changing fast, especially for less expensive options. And the SLR magic is running in front when it comes to driving down the cost. But are they driving down the quality as well? Now, I personally wasn't ready to start exploring $1,000 lenses to figure out which of the dozen low-budget options worked for me. So I took a closer look, a really close look, at the cheapest, quality-oriented option for full frame. The SLR Magic Anamorphot 40 adapter. It's a lens that most indie filmmakers can afford. It's solidly built, compact, and inexpensive. But is it a toy or a professional tool? First, the basics. It weighs eight and a half ounces, so roughly half a pound. It's all metal, and in the hand, it's got a little heft to it. But it's smaller and lighter than many of the lenses it will go on. Once on, however, you do have a considerable lens adapter setup in terms of weight and size. The focus ring is buttery smooth. Overall, the build quality is excellent. And if it's not obvious by now, it's an adapter, not a lens. It has a 52 millimeter thread for the taking lens. You can use step up and down filters to attach 49 to 58 millimeter lenses, but beyond that, it's likely to vignette. It has a 62 millimeter front for filters, but it doesn't like filters. Nearly every filter I tried added a slight vignette, forcing me to crop in. If you've seen other reviews, you know that the 40 in the name refers to the diameter of the lens glass, not the focal length. But in most situations, 
you'll find that a 40 millimeter focal length is about the widest that you can go. What's important about the name is that a 65 millimeter lens that has a glass larger than 40 millimeters will vignette, even though it's a 65. So you can really only attach certain lenses with filter threads smaller than 58 millimeters. My Samyang 35mm has a 58mm front thread, but the glass is considerably smaller. With this lens, I get only a slight vignette at 35mm, whereas my Nikon 35, which has a smaller 52mm thread, vignetted heavily. So, the adapter's capabilities change with the taking lens. Now, that may sound obvious, but you'd be surprised at how frequently and how dramatically that comes up. The adapter is designed for cameras that shoot in 16x9. The 1.33 squeeze becomes a 2.35 aspect ratio in post, which is one of the most common widescreen formats. Overall, the 40 doesn't diminish the amount of light entering the camera at all. Your f4 remains an f4 in terms of light transmission. Its closest focusing distance, again slightly dependent on the taking lens, is just under 3 feet. It attaches with a locking ring that's fairly easy to use and, for the most part, stays snug as you turn the adapter's near-normal ring. Attaching takes roughly 30 seconds to align and, to be honest, I've only ever done it by sight. Anamorphic images are stretched in post, so if it's not aligned, the stretch won't be perfectly horizontal. If you want to be precise, you can use your cell phone to create flares and your camera's leveler to find perfect alignment. But with a guide on top, I found that I could approximate it by sight just fine. New, the Anamorphot runs about $340. Used, it will be hard to find, but I did get mine for $265. One of the best things about an adapter is that you can put it on different lenses. One adapter can make a set of anamorphic lenses and save you thousands compared to the alternative. In my case, I have successfully paired it with the 35mm Samyang and with 50 and 100mm Nikon manual lenses. These are lenses that I already own in my collection, and the old Nikons are all 52mm, which is super convenient for the Anamorphot 40. And they're sharp, high-resolution lenses. The Samyang, with its punchy colors and high contrast, is quite compelling as well. And it has autofocus, which I'll get to in a moment. So I've got a full set of anamorphic glass for under 350 bucks. But is it a quality set of anamorphics? Or will the images or the hassle keep it off my camera? It's important to note, and I cannot stress this enough, that the performance and the characteristics of the adapter depends a lot on the taking lens and its setup. The lens's issues tend to be amplified. Does the taking lens suffer from barrel distortion? It'll be worse with this adapter. Ugly bokeh? Bugly. But the adapter also keeps much about what's good about your lens. Nice contrast? Still got it. Beautiful bokeh? Sure. In truth, you could do a 10 minute review of this adapter with each taking lens because the difference in how it performs from sharpness to chromatic aberrations is significant. And this Amorphot constantly defied my expectations, producing quirks and frustrations and unexpected bits of happiness. It's not a lens you can simply slap on your body and go shoot a job. Even a couple of hours and the learning curve isn't sufficient to fully understand its limits and strengths. So, there is a lot to discuss when evaluating this adapter. And with most anamorphics, you can't evaluate it with the clinical criteria that you use for spherical lenses. In regards to sharpness, chromatic aberrations, flare and distortion, it's not meant to be as clean as a spherical. A lot is up to your taste. It's about what you like and what you can tolerate. But let's get into it. If your lens suffers from barrel distortion, the adapter will increase it slightly. Though overall, it does a pretty decent job of keeping the line straight, and it's easy to remove that distortion in post. Here you can see my son's face isn't overly distorted, thin or flattened at the edge of the frame. And this is the Samyang 35mm, which does suffer from noticeable barrel distortion. And then there are chromatic aberrations. Anamorphics are known to have a lot of these, and the SLR Magic is no exception. At f2.8, you'll get fringing and halation in the high contrast areas of your image. Halation isn't a phenomenon that I was familiar with. I never had a lens that did it. Essentially, it's a glow around the bright areas, and initially, I hated it. It disappears as you stop down, and I also became aware of how hard some cinematographers work to introduce halation into their images, using haze or post-processing or black mist filters to soften the highlights. 
you will never need a black mist filter with this adapter. But if you like a clean image, this may not be a good compromise. The Anamorphot is not alone in this department, however. These halation barrels distortions and chromatic aberrations appear in $10,000 lenses. As I mentioned, the contrast is as good as your taking lens. The Anamorphot does a good job of keeping that contrast above f4, but there's diminishing contrast below that. Bokeh is dependent on your taking lens as well, but you're likely to be disappointed with what the adapter adds. The Amorphot doesn't produce oval bokeh balls. You'd be tempted to blame this on the square opening, but the 1.33 squeeze is also at work. It's just not enough to stretch those highlights. But bokeh is more than globes of highlight. It refers to the overall quality of the blur. And the Amorphot does produce that swirly, slightly chaotic blur we associate with amorphic lenses. Sharpness is a big deal, and here the SLR magic is complicated. SLR claims that the adapter is sharp down to f2.8, and that is perhaps a good baseline, something you can count on across all lenses. But I'll say it again, it depends on the lens. With my Samyang 35, I felt that f2.2 was still sharp and contrasty enough for use. My Nikon 50, however, was less sharp than I had hoped at 2.8, and less contrasty and that happened to be the lens I used for these upcoming tests. Here we've got a simple sharpness setup. At f8, the center is quite sharp with decent contrast. I think the image is still holding its own well at f5.6. I mean, check out the hair on the dead cat poking out from behind the paper. I mean, the audio mic dead cat. At 5.6, the edge is softer, but still very usable. As you open up the lens, it gets progressively softer from there. At f2.8, you're still functional across most of the frame, but you're starting to see some fringing. At f2, which is wider than recommended, the edge is completely soft, worthy only of the out-of-focus areas of an image, and the center is soft and lacking in contrast. But it's still usable, in my opinion. Now, you may not agree with this statement based on these test images, but check it out in the real world. At f2, the image is softer, especially at the edges, but considering the impact of motion blur, I found that the aperture looked just fine with moving subjects. You know, the type we like to film, moving pictures. It lacks that digital high definition sharpness, but you can still see important details. In my real world, the lens was plenty sharp even at f2. In these clips, we don't notice that the image isn't perfectly sharp because it's moving, and our brains are hardwired to approximate the image. It's why we film moving subjects at 50 frames per second, even though we wouldn't photograph a moving subject at 1 50th of a second. Depending on the lens, I'd say f2.2 to f2.8 is sharp enough for most circumstances, though you'll need to add back in some contrast and post. And keep in mind that we often pick a really shallow depth of field for close-up work of subjects with minimal movement. In those situations, you're more likely to notice the soft image. So it depends on what you're shooting as well. In general though, I'd recommend shooting around f4 to 5.6 for a good balance between sharpness and depth of field. The Anamorphot has a dual focusing system. Many traditional anamorphic lenses require you to focus two sets of lenses to reach peak sharpness. It's one of the bummers of traditional anamorphics. The SLR Magic has a near normal focus ring for subjects between roughly mm, 3 feet and 15 feet. I'll get into that roughly in a bit. The dual system makes focusing more fiddly, but if you're adept at manual focus, and I grew up using all manual lenses, it's not that challenging or time consuming in controlled settings. What's more, the adapter doesn't compromise your autofocus system, so you can combine the two, manually focusing the adapter while autofocusing the lens. I was worried, though, that the dual focusing would take too long in uncontrolled environments, where you don't know which direction your subject is going to go. And again, my expectations were pretty much knocked down. I discovered that while technically you need to dial in a precise focus on the adapter for the sharpest image, in reality you could work in four zones just fine. Near for objects three to five feet away, one third of the way to normal for objects six to eight feet, two thirds for subjects nine to 12 feet, and normal for things farther than that. Images shot with this approximate approach were plenty sharp on screen. And with autofocus lenses, you can approximate the adapter's distance and hit the autofocus button. And that's like, you know, one and a half seconds. 
I also discovered that if I set my Sony A1 in the photography mode, i.e. manual, I get an eight and a half times magnification for focusing, which is crazy close. And what's more, unlike the video mode in photography, the camera transmits that magnification to your external monitor, as long as you're not recording. Once you hit the record, it reverts back to the video mode and its limitations. Punching in then is only visible on the back of your camera, but not the monitor. But with the camera set to manual, I could precisely focus my image quickly and with ease before starting to shoot. What's also true is that with a 1.33 squeeze, the image isn't so squashed that you can't evaluate it on a camera that doesn't have de-squeeze built in. Sony, please wake up. All in all, despite my concerns, I found that the 40 wasn't difficult to handle in the field. I mean, I filmed my two and five-year-old sons and they're tough. Dual focusing is, without a doubt, more cumbersome than a single focusing system. Now, there are solutions for dual focusing, and by that I mean the Rapido 16A and the SLR Magic Cine Rangefinder. These are lenses that attach to the front of your anamorphic lens and control the entire focusing process. Now, these are worthy of their own review, so I won't go too deeply into their pros and cons, but I will say that while the Rapido is sharper, it's also bigger and heavier and vignettes more easily. The SLR Magic Cine Rangefinder is a better choice for this adapter. The single focusing solution allows the use of focus pullers and eliminates the anamorphic focus breathing issue as well. Now, considering how much glass you've added to the front of your sensor, I think it's fairly sharp, but you can spot the difference in detail and increased halation. And if you're like me and you have an adapter, lens, anamorphot, and rangefinder setup, you'll need lens supports, and thus a rig with the rails. And of course, another $280 for the rangefinder, bringing your complete setup closer to $700. Between the added weight and the loss of sharpness, you'll probably find that you'll take the rangefinder on and off the lens as needed. So it's a solution that comes with its own set of hassles. Dual focusing, however, is just one of the frustrations of this little adapter. The SLR Magic is also not consistently 1.33 in its squeeze. It varies from 1.25 at the near setting to 1.35 at the normal. This means you can't simply de-squeeze by 1.33 in post. You have to evaluate each shot to determine the appropriate amount. Now, believe it or not, this is a fairly common issue even with expensive anamorphic lenses. The Suri 50mm T2.9, for example, claims a 1.6 squeeze, but at the minimal focus range, you're getting 1.51 from this $1,500 lens. As I mentioned, single focusing solutions like the SLR Magic Rangefinder will eliminate this effect because you're not focusing the adapter, it maintains the same 1.33 squeeze throughout. You do, however, get some regular focus breathing with the angle of view changing, and in this respect, it's not as elegant as a good cine lens. The Anamorphot also doesn't flare super easy, which is a good thing in my opinion. You need a strong light source pointed directly at the lens. When it does flare, the lines are distractingly blue and sharp. So much so that they look a little fake, like you added them in post. If you're a fan of the horizontal flare, you may not be bothered by this, and there are some ways to adjust the color and saturation of the flare and post, so it's not a complete fail. But if you want a soft, organic lens flare, this isn't the tool. The image characteristics, the halation, aberrations, sharpness, distortion, all change from lens to lens. And the squeeze ratio and the importance of the near normal setting and how it reacts with other elements such as filters are common across all lenses, but change based on the distance to the subject. Now these two realms of change are what make the anamorphot unpredictable, or maybe more accurately, something that requires extensive study to predict. Now this is my first time working with anamorphics, and I'll admit that the additional width, the widescreen effect, was a little disappointing at first. It's the 1.33 squeeze. This amount of anamorphics gives the 40 millimeter the angle of view of a 30 millimeter lens, and a 50 the expanse, if you can call it that, of a 38 millimeter lens, and that's not huge. And since you can't go much wider than 40 millimeters, you never get that startlingly wide landscape. You do better with a 20 millimeter spherical lens. But the more I worked with the adapter, the more I grew to appreciate both the extra width and the fact that it wasn't too wide. The greater the squeeze, the more surreal and unnatural images tend to feel. The background often separates from the subject like you're shooting with an extreme telephoto lens. 
Anamorphics, even at two times, tend to draw attention to themselves, which much of the time, in my opinion, doesn't make for great storytelling. And I don't really want images wider than 2.39. For me, really wide, short screens are distracting. But, you know, that's just me, my preference. The Amorphos, on the other hand, creates a subtle anamorphic perspective that at times is quite ordinary, and at times slightly surreal or heightened. When it's not flaring, which is most of the time, it doesn't draw much attention to itself. This means you might find that it's not anamorphic enough for shooting in normal conditions, but in the end, I liked the subtlety. Close focusing is often a problem with anamorphic lenses and adapters. The anamorphos closest distance is about 2.8 inches. To get closer, you'll need a diopter for the front, but whew, another hassle. Most anamorphic lenses, regardless of price, can't do much better than this. But the anamorphot has an advantage here because you can pair it with a longer lens with a relatively close focus. So let's take a moment to go over the drawbacks of the adapter. You're limited to lenses with essentially a 52mm front thread. This may be a big limitation for people with a set of modern lenses. You can't shoot wider than 35mm, and it can't shoot closer than roughly 3 feet. F2.2 is usable, but a little soft, and it's slow to reach its maximum sharpness, which is around F8. The dual focus system is cumbersome compared to a spherical lens, and you cannot rack focus over a sizable distance with this setup, not without a single focus lens on top of everything else. If the near normal dial has to move, you are busted. It will look ugly and breathe horribly, both in the squeeze and in the perspective. The flares are also a bit harsh, and the bokeh isn't oval. Oof, that sounds like a lot of negatives. But on the plus side, it can be used with a wide range of lenses above 35mm, and it's easy to create a set of anamorphics. Older lenses, as long as they're sharp, make great inexpensive choices. And it can be taken off those lenses for a spherical equivalent with similar characteristics, which is kind of handy. Its low-light, wide aperture capabilities is on par with many high-end anamorphic lenses that cost 20 times more. And the autofocus works on the taking lens, making this a hybrid manual lens, which is something you virtually never see in dedicated anamorphic lenses. While hefty, it's much lighter than the dedicated versions of the anamorphics, and you can fly it on a small gimbal and shoot in just about any configuration. The anamorphic 2.35 perspective is at times quite captivating. It's ever so slightly surreal without drawing too much attention to itself. It's sufficiently sharp, easy to use, and good lenses make for good images. And the anamorphot is fairly inexpensive. If you go all in and get the rangefinder, you'll get a single focus anamorphic with no breathing and a minimal loss of sharpness. And that increases significantly the adapter's functionality. Now those are some big positives. What it boils down to is that if you have compatible lenses and you accept the limitations that are a part of all anamorphics, it's a capable lens and a good introduction into the anamorphic world. But could you use it for professional work? From the beginning, I debated whether this was a real tool or a toy. In truth, you can achieve beautiful professional images out of it, and that qualifies as a pro tool. But the constant breathing and the squeeze factor and its unpredictability and the inability to rack focus are characteristics that belong in the toy category. Mm, sort of. Because to make this even more difficult, anamorphic lenses that cost much, much more in the thousands of dollars aren't able to rack focus without anamorphic breathing, and their predictability comes at a price of a single focal length. As you pay more for an anamorphic lens, the breathing improves and the chromatic aberrations diminish. You also get better flares. But you pay for these improvements with ungodly weight, awkward handling, and devilish pricing. And the improvements are painfully slow compared to the increased cost. And you'll need two or three of these devilish lenses to achieve true flexibility. So you're talking three grand before you can even start a reasonable comparison between this and a dedicated anamorphic lens. Now think about that. If you want a real competition, you'll need to shell out at least three grand to find a dedicated pair of lenses for comparison because having more than one focal length is, on a functional level, really important. Now, I'm not knocking the Siri, because I think it's an excellent lens for the price, but you should consider that the Siri 50mm has considerable squeeze breathing and no autofocus. It's also heavier and has an odd squeeze factor and is only T2.9. 
and it has a minimum aperture of T16. We don't often consider the minimum aperture, but in film where you're technically locked into 1 50th of a second, a T16 can't shoot on a sunny day without a neutral density filter. You know, the sunny 16 rule. But it is sharper, and the single focusing lens offers cleaner handling. With the 1.6 squeeze, you'll get those oval bokeh, and the 50mm has an angle of view of a 30, so it has clear advantages. If the Siri and the Magic both cost the same, I might be hard pressed to decide which to buy. But they don't cost the same. To compare to another anamorphic lens, the $9,000 Atlas Orion 65mm is virtually distortion free and chromatic aberrations are slight. But for its price, it's noticeably soft wide open and breathes significantly when focusing. Atlas themselves describe a quote, pleasant spherical aberration glow when wide open, which is another way of saying it suffers from that irritating blurry halation when wide open. It has a minimum focus distance that's roughly equivalent to the Anamorphot and a whopping five pound weight. They label all of these unpleasantries as vintage anamorphic, but what it boils down to is that in 80% of the shots, I don't believe you could tell which was the $350 Anamorphot and which the $10,000 Atlas. The remaining 20%, things like this and that, are reasons for the cost differential. But you could, in most cases, simply plan around the shortcomings of the SLR Magic. What's equally important is that many of the flaws of the Magic are, to some extent, the characteristics of anamorphic that people are seeking. The softer, less clinical image, the swirly, chaotic blur, the striking and chaotic flares, and the halation are a part of the look that says, hey, I used an anamorphic lens. For creators seeking the anamorphic look, the question becomes, which part of the look do you want, and how much are you willing to pay for it? The Anamorphot tends to offer all of the characteristics with heavy-handed emphasis. More costly solutions give you the ability to pick and choose which characteristics or shortcomings are prominent, and which are more subtle. As I said at the beginning, times are changing for inexpensive anamorphic lenses, and I expect we'll see more and more offerings that are worth considering. The Great Joy 50mm, for example, is a compelling choice with its 1.8 squeeze factor and a single focus setup. So for the time being, there is no definitive way to prioritize or rate options out there. You just gotta keep evaluating. Everything considered, I decided that this is a professional tool, especially when matched with a rangefinder. It's just not great in every situation. It lacks the versatility of a spherical lens, but then again, all anamorphic lenses do to some extent. An anamorphic lens isn't great for a number of things. You wouldn't want to use it in real estate or architectural video. You'd probably think twice before using them in a documentary or for product shots. And the dreamy quality isn't right for most corporate interviews. It's great for music videos, vlogs, and while you can fake flares, halation, and chaotic blur in post, you can't replicate a 50 millimeter lens with a 37 millimeter angle of view. As a cheap solution for anamorphic shooting, I was fairly impressed. In most cases, my blown expectations landed on the favorable side. It's not the easiest lens to learn, and you have to study its limitations lens by lens because otherwise it's too unpredictable. But it's a nifty tool for creating compelling images, and it handles decently in the field. But, and here is the biggest challenge for me. If it's not good for every shot, you have to figure out when it makes sense and then make sure your footage from your spherical lens is set up to match your anamorphic. Mixing spherical and anamorphic lenses is a significant headache and should give every creator pause, especially if you can't plan out every shot in advance. So while I'm fascinated by this adapter and what it can offer, I am not yet confident that I'll use it with much frequency. Though, yeah, just to be irritating, I'd make that statement if I was holding a $9,000 Atlas Orion. Why? Because I value being able to shoot quickly, being able to mount it on a gimbal or swap it out for another focal length, which are things the Anamorphot can do better. The Anamorphot 40 is SLR Magic's cheapest entry into the anamorphic field, but you can still find the Anamorphot 50 on eBay and used it'll cost about 60 bucks more. Now you might wonder, given its bigger size and specs, if it's worth the upgrade. After all, it accepts bigger lenses, has bigger glass, and an oval opening for oval bokeh. Does the 50 solve any of the 40's issues? Well, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the market. The day after I purchased my 40, my old research turned up this 
Anamorphot, 50 at auction for $15. It still had a week to go, but I kept my eye on it. A used 50 generally runs about $400. The seller had listed it for parts due to a sticky gunk on the front lens. He wasn't a camera dealer, so he didn't have a sense of how serious the problem was or how to fix it. I had the sense that it could probably be cleaned, and even if it wasn't perfect, the edge placement of the gunk would have a minimal impact on the image. A week later, I paid $66 plus tax and shipping for the adapter, and as I expected, the gunk came off with some sensor cleaning fluid. So hopefully there will be a comparison between the 40 and the 50 coming soon. Is it worth the extra 60 bucks for a used copy of the bigger lens? And will the 50 be as surprising as its smaller brother? Subscribe and find out.